Father, we thank you for today. Thank you for your people that you have brought forth from north, south, east, and west, from diverse places to come to your presence today. Father, we know one thing, and that is you are here. And as a result of the fact that you are here, everyone who comes here will have a divine encounter today in the name of Jesus. We'll have an encounter with you, and we know everybody who encounters you cannot remain the same again in the name of Jesus. In fact, they are taking steps to become transformed more into your image in the name of Jesus. And that's my prayer for every soul gathered here today in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Praise God. So we're going to continue on our theme, Transforming Me. Last week we looked at um, a little bit about the mechanism of transformation and exactly what, exactly how the Holy Spirit transforms us. Um, it was entitled um, The Man in the Mirror. And we looked at it telling ourselves from our theme scripture in Second Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, that we, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of God, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of God. So all of us can see that pasted or posted everywhere around us. But we examined last week that the mirror we are talking about when we talk about beholding in a mirror the glory of God is the word of God. And it is impossible to be transformed without the word of God. And we looked at various methods by which we can be transformed. How do we expose ourselves to the Word of God in a way that will result in transformation? And we talked about the quiet time, listening to messages, personal deep study of the Word of God. And we examine the results of this transformation that when we behold ourselves in the mirror, it is incumbent on ourselves to make some changes if changes need to be made. It reminds me of an illustration I read about, about some missionaries that went to a remote area where the people had never seen a mirror. You know, it was not in their culture or their practice to have mirrors. So, it gave a little girl a mirror as a gift. So the girl hung the mirror on a tree and kept on looking at the mirror. And all of a sudden, to the chagrin of the person who gave her the mirror, the girl took the mirror and smashed it on the ground. Why? She later explained that she did not like the way she looked in the mirror. So her solution to this situation was not changing herself. Her solution was removing the mirror so she would not see how she looked. Many times as a believer, we do that. We don't like the way the word of God makes us look because the word of God is a mirror. Through the Holy Spirit, we start getting convicted about things that we need to change. But instead of changing them, what do we do? We decide to either change the Bible or throw the Bible away. Or even if we are not you know, bold enough or brave enough to throw the Bible away, what do we do? We put the Bible under something such that so long as we are not seeing the Bible, we believe that we are good. If the man of God is talking to you on the TV, then 
you decide to change the channel to something else, maybe sports or news, where they'll be talking about something that is a little more, will make you a little more comfortable. Or worse still, if the man of God is talking to you in church, or the search the scriptures is about you in church, or the prayer is about you, what do you do? Tune yourself out. You see, the solution to the mirror is not the mirror. The solution to the mirror is you, which is why we've said here, the theme is transforming me. It's not transforming your husband. It's not transforming your buddy next to you. It's not transforming the member of your unit. It's not transforming that voice in your head, whatever the voice in your head is, you know, it could be your mama, it could be your wife, it could be your pastor, it could be your brother in Christ, whoever it is, the solution is not, it could be the TV. When I mean the TV, I mean the TV preacher. But the fact is that the solution is not changing that. The solution is changing you. The other results of exposure to the word or the mirror is spiritual maturity because we told ourselves last week that you know people who continuously need milk are not mature but those who can stand solid food you know who can actually look at the mirror and face the mirror and be bold enough to make changes are people who, by reason of exercise, by reason of what continuous exposure, they can tell the difference between good and evil. If somebody has to keep telling you that, you know, don't touch this, don't touch that, or people have to continuously lock all the cupboards because they are concerned that you hurt yourself, you know, then you are not mature because you can't tell the difference between good and evil. It reminds me of my children, you know, by, by God has blessed us with a few of them so we are able to, you know, I can observe the differences between them. There was one of them that you had to lock everything. Because if you didn't lock everything, that child was going to create a chemical reaction in your own household. There was another of the children that you tell them, don't touch any of these household chemicals. And the child would say, don't touch chemicals. And that was it. You didn't have to worry. But in the same vein, there are different types of us in the house of God. Some of us, all the pastor has to say is, you know, don't do it. And you say, the pastor said, we should not do it. The general overseer said, we should not do it. And they are good. But there are some people that you still have to continuously lock in you have to continue locking the cupboards. You have to tell them that, you know, the television is the devil's briefcase, so throw it away. There are different types of people. But the fact is that by the time you are truly transformed, your senses are what exercised to the point of view that nobody has to tell you what you should do. You know. You can discern this is evil and that is good. But you won't be a, like another of my set of children that their own was even on a higher level because they would take the chemicals. After you told them not to take it, they will first break the lock. And when they finish breaking the lock, then they take the chemicals and they will say, you see, this is the way they mix it. And they will join together to do what? Mix the chemicals to see what will happen. 
God will not let us be like that in Jesus' name. We are not going to hear that. The, 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 the general overseer said, do not do this. The Bible says, do not do this. Of course, the general overseer is repeating what the Bible says. And you say, let, let me just try it and see what will happen. Why did God say we should not do it? And God will help us in Jesus' name. Holiness is another result of the mirror. Because we know that God is a holy God. And it's a thing that we're going to explore again today. Because exposure to the light of the word makes us light ourselves. So today we're going to look a little more about transformation. And we're going to ask ourselves over the next week or two. What are the ways we can measure transformation? So how can you look at yourself and tell yourself, yes, I'm actually headed in the right direction. Like in any endeavor, there are metrics. The metrics might be qualitative metrics. They might be quantitative metrics by which you can tell if somebody is making a change or the person is being transformed if you look at the point of view of medical science for example there are ways that some doctors can tell if you are taking the medicine they gave you or not how do they do that they tell you that every month you must get some lab work drawn and you don't know what they are looking for in the lab work. But they can look at the lab work and they can tell whether or not you've been taking the medicine. Or, ah, doctor, I've been taking the medicine every day, morning and night. So it's either you're a unicorn and that is like conventional wisdom does not apply to you or you haven't been taking the medicine and like I've read in the past, when you hear hoofbeats, what do you think about? Do you think about horses or do you think about zebras? If you are in America, you think about horses. So the most likely thing is that the person was not taking the medicine. So in the same vein, we as believers, there are ways we can measure whether or not there is transformation or not. See, the Greek word is metamorpho which is the root word for the scientific term metamorphosis and with any measure or metrics there must be a standard on which that thing is being measured i want us to know that the standard there's no there's no ambiguity about the standard by which you measure your transformation and the standard is jesus christ that is why the Bible tells us in our root scripture that, you know, when you observe the glory of God, you are being transformed into the same image. That image is the image of Jesus Christ because that is the manifestation of the glory of God that we see on earth. So, if in the process of measuring yourself, you are not becoming more like Jesus. Then, Houston, we have a problem. You need to examine yourself and tell yourself daily, am I becoming more like Jesus or not? But now, let's go to some of the metrics. A common imagery used in the scripture when you are describing metamorphosis or transformation is light now it implies two things you know one is that like we've said before there is the influence of the lord on man which is through jesus christ and in the bible the common imagery used for jesus christ making a change in your life is the light 
The Bible says in the book of Matthew chapter 4 verse 13 to 16. It tells us that on leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the regions of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled what was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan of Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And upon those who sat in the region and shadow of death, a light has shined. So, that implies that the spiritual influence on you is the light. But it also implies something else. Those people who tell you, because there was somebody that you know I've ministered to at one point in the other or the other, and he told me that you know I'm against organized religion. I just like to worship my own God in my own way and in my own corner. You see, this imagery of light implies one thing that regardless of how you say you want to worship God, people will see whether you are being transformed or not. Because light, unless you are dealing with somebody who is blind, and for the purpose of this discussion, everybody can see, you will see light. If light has changed somebody. If somebody is transformed by the light, it is visible on the outside. So you cannot say you are being transformed to be more like Jesus and nobody can see that you are more like Jesus. People have to see that you are more like Jesus. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, which is one of our theme scriptures. It says, For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So, the more you know about Jesus Christ, the more you act like Jesus Christ, the more people can see that you are Jesus Christ. So that's the first general point about transformation. The second general point, and you know I alluded to the discussion we had during the last book club. How many of us were at the last book club? Okay, so a good number of us were there. Because the whole discussion had to do with the mechanics of transformation, the process of transformation. But the second thing, and the, the, you know there were different schools of thought. I believe all the schools of thought were right in one way or the other. But another aspect of transformation is that transformation, there's an element of instantaneous transformation. That is, you become born again, old things have passed away, and behold, the new has come. So, there's that element of transformation that you give your life over to Jesus Christ, and some people talk about it, that they give their life over to Jesus Christ, Say they were drinkers before, all of a sudden, the alcohol became abhorrent to them. They were smokers before, and all of a sudden, the cigarette smoke became abhorrent to them. Yes, there is that element. But there is also the element of time. That even though like Jesus appeared on the mountain of transfiguration and the Bible says immediately his clothes became white, whiter than any body can bleach them. Which meant that even if he, there was a little bit of dust on his clothes from the journey, everything became immediately bleached. There's that element. But there is also the element which we see in our scripture today which implies that transformation occurs over time. So let's look at, and not only does transformation occur over time, but transformation is best measured by observing somebody over time. 
two of Jesus' parables illustrate this. And he said, the kingdom of God is as if a man. Mark chapter 4, verse 26 to 29. Mark 4, 26 to 29 tells us, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground, and he should sleep by night and rise by day, and the seed should sprout and grow. He himself does not know how. For the earth yields crops by itself, first the blade, then the head, then the full grain in the head. But when the grain ripens immediately, he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. So the process of transformation implies that if you do what you are supposed to do as a child of God, the process of transformation is occurring organically in the background. Such that it's only over time that somebody will come back, somebody who knew you before. You underwent the process of transformation. They will look at you and say, you have changed. You yourself might not know how you changed. Because it's an organic spiritual process. If you expose yourself to the word of God, allow the Holy Spirit of God to do his work in your life, you are being transformed. You don't know how. You don't know the nuts and bolts. It's a spiritual process that is occurring in the background. And all of a sudden, you see there's germination. Then the blade comes out. Then the head comes out. Then the full grain comes out. And then you start to see results of transformation. All you really need to do is to start to take the first step. Which was the farmer sowed his seed on the ground and then went to sleep as he was supposed to. Rose up and then the changes started to occur. The other illustration gives another example of transformation. It tells us that, you know, the kingdom of heaven, Matthew chapter 13, verse 31 to 32, another of Jesus' parables said, there is another illustration. It's like a mustard seed which a man took and sowed in the field, which indeed is the least of all the seeds. But when it is grown, it is greater than the herbs and becomes a tree. So that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. So we're saying that you as a believer. The seed, of course, we know that the seed implies the word of God. From the parable of the sower that Jesus Christ said. So the word of God starts to bear fruit in your life. And then the implication is that the tree grows bigger and bigger until you become a person that the birds can nest in your branches. That is, you become a blessing. But it all comes from taking the first step, which is allowing the word of God to work in your life. When the word of God is working in your life, the light starts to shine through you and you become a blessing to those people around you. But you have to take that first step. To allow the word of God to work in your life. Last week we talked about the process of training. And you know. It's akin to that same process of metamorphosis. That I told you about. It reminds me of some time in my life. I spent a year. As a surgical resident. And honestly. That was one of the toughest years of my life. But you know, the interesting thing about it is that even though I did not end up practicing as a surgeon because I did something else, there was a difference between myself and some of the other guys with me, guys and girls with me, who did not pass through that kind of training. There was a difference. Because you know, in that place, that place is kind of, there's interesting things happening in that place. Let's just put it that way. There was one guy who used to be the president of he's now passed away the first 
black president of the American College of Surgeons. That man used to start his clinic. Those of you who know what clinic is, you know, when you go and see a doctor, when you have a problem, you come from home and you go see the doctor. He used to start his clinic at 6 o'clock in the morning. And people will be there. They will be full because if you want to see him, you have to come at 6 o'clock. But you know what it means? You, who you are going to walk there, if you are going to be there for that clinic, what time are you going to get there? You're going to get there well before 6, which means you have to wake up at 4.30, isn't it, to leave your house. So imagine doing that day in and day out. All of a sudden, and those, type, those people, nobody cares about what you, your situation is. Just show up before 6 o'clock. No excuses. So all of a sudden, up till now, my children will be telling me some stories. I don't, I said, those are excuses. Just what, what time did the coach say you are supposed to go for practice? Ah, that coach is very wicked. He said we should come for practice at 6 o'clock in the morning. Oh, he said you should come at 6 o'clock. Okay, get up at 4.30 and let's go. 6 o'clock, you are going to be there. Oh, but, 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 but the coach, why, why, why is he telling us? Ah. Coach says 6 o'clock. Show up at 6 o'clock. End of story. I don't want to hear any story. You better figure out how you are going to go to bed on time. Whatever you are going to have to do, to get yourself ready, just get yourself ready. So it implies that some things are going to change about you. Because if you are going to show up for practice at 6 o'clock, you cannot eat all the eggs and grits and all that stuff that you would have normally ate. You know, if, whatever, if you are the kind of person that you, know, you eat swallow for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, by the time you, you join that team, you are not going to eat... Sw- <laughs> If you eat swallow before you go for that practice, what will happen? The swallow will end up on the courts. And everybody will know what you Nigerian people or African people eat for breakfast. So, you are going to change. You are going to figure out what it is that you can eat that is dry and in a smaller quantity that will do what? Give you the energy you need to go through that practice. There's going to be a change in your behavior. There's going to be a level of maturity that will change. It's the same way with us as believers. God causes us to pass through some circumstances. And by the time the word of God enters our lives, our behaviors change. Which is why the Bible says God caused the children of, of, of Israel, when he was bringing them out to the promised land, forced to hunger. And then he fed them with manna from heaven, a way their fathers did not know. So they will know that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Some of the stuff you are going through now, you are going through it because God needs to teach you a lesson. God needs to toughen you up. God needs to make sure that that culture that your father and mother taught you, that he said this is how we do stuff in our village, Whatever the name of your village is called, you don't, want, you don't need to tell me because I'm not going to tell you the name of that village myself. Just know that stuff must change because you are a child of God now and that behavior is not going to allow you to progress, to move forward, to be transformed as a child of God. Let's look at some of the metrics we are talking about over the next few weeks. We're going to look at a few of them. But the first of them, we've already looked at it. But let's do a slightly, tease it out a little bit. And that is the light. You see, light implies positivity and absence of negativity or ugliness. Like the old African-American saying goes, God don't like ugly. So if you are a child of God and you are always going around and you are influencing where you are with negativity, you come in, you know, you are Debbie D, Debbie the Downer. Every, once you enter the atmosphere like this, everybody's happy. Then all of a sudden, ah, you have come. The Bible tells us something. 
Philippians 2 verse 14 to 15. Do all things without complaining and disputing that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. So the implication is that the light of God shines in your life. You become a positive influence wherever you are. All the complaining, you know, yeah, the, 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 the boss doesn't like us. The company doesn't like us. I have to walk too far to come here. Eh, my car is this. Eh, my wife is that. My children are this. Oh, always something. Ask God to help you to do things without complaining or disputing. Because one of the reasons why, whether you like it or not, why the children of Israel could not get to the promised land is complaining. The Bible says that, you know, our fathers, they had the same experience that we are having now. They passed through the cloud, they were baptized in the cloud. But with them, God was not pleased and their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. And one of the things, you'll be surprised, right up there. Because you might tell yourself, yes, I thank the Lord. I'm not like these other people. I don't commit sexual immorality. I don't um, party. I don't drink. But you complain. You complain. The Bible says, do not complain. Because those were among the things that made people's bodies get destroyed in the wilderness. So, as much as possible, complaining, fighting all the time. You know, you fight the pastor because the pastor was preaching. You say, pastor, you are preaching about me. Honestly, you hear all sorts of stuff. You are preaching at me. Who, 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 who am I supposed to be preaching to? Me? But I will not say that. You know, I say, okay, um, you know, uh, the, the whole, I don't think it was really me that was preaching to you. Maybe it was the Holy Spirit that was preaching to you. You say, pastor was preaching to you. Who is pastor supposed to preach to? Actually, that's a good thing. Because it means that out of everybody here, counts all the people around here in this church. God decided to choose you for pastor to preach to. That's a good thing. It's a good thing. To praise God that they are preaching to you in church. The Bible says people who are sick, who are coming to the doctor, the people who need to be preached to, are coming to church. So, that's a good thing. So you don't need to quarrel with people because they are preaching to you or this sister, they, there's always my own, they are always mentioning why is it that they are always talking about the stuff that I'm dealing with. Why? That's a good thing. They are supposed to talk about it. So don't quarrel with them. Instead, be thanking God so that you can become children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8 to 9, For you were once darkness, now you are light in the world. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Yes. The pastor is preaching to you. I am preaching to me too. God is speaking to you. Because God wants to make sure that you become a child of light. The light shines in the darkness and the Bible says the darkness cannot overcome it. So the first measure is light. The next measure is boldness. <clears throat> I want you to know that the gospel is very plain. It's very simple. The Bible tells us that 2 Corinthians 3.12 which is one of the scriptures that precedes this, our theme scripture. It says, since this new way gives us confidence, we can be very bold. Why? Because the gospel is very, very simple. The Bible tells us in Acts chapter 17 verse 30, very simple. It says, God overlooked people's ignorance about those things in earlier times. Or to put it in the New King James Version, Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Therefore, the gospel is very easy. 
The things I used to do, those songs that we used to sing as children, I do them no more. God expects that, okay, yes, the times of ignorance, God has said, okay, no problem. You didn't know you were supposed to come at 10 o'clock, but I forgive you. But tomorrow, come at 10 o'clock. Otherwise, you will run, you will jump. Or well, like in our own case, you will suffer corporal punishment when I was in boarding school. But whatever the case is, Jesus has forgiven you the first time. He has overlooked whatever mistake you made, whatever ignorance you did not have. You knew you are not supposed to, you didn't know you are not supposed to lie. Because everybody in your family, they are all what? Liars. You had only example of liars. If everybody in your family, they were players. Now, Jesus is saying, stop playing. There needs to be a change. But God, the gospel is simple. So you should be bold to be able to declare the gospel. You should be bold to be able to act like you are a child of God, like you are a child of the light. The Bible tells us that Acts 4, 13. You should be bold to say you are a child of God. Because it's very simple. If they tell you, ah, you call yourself a child of God. And why were you, ah, don't worry. That was in the past. Now I have been transformed. The Bible said in Acts 4.13 that when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled. They realized that they had been with Jesus. End of story. So when they realized that, ah, the man, the beggar came to them. And said, give me a handout. And they said, silver and gold have I none. But what I have will I give unto you. In the name of Jesus, rise up. Then they were like, ah, these guys were just, are just fishermen. How can they be talking like this and reasoning with people this way? And they realized that even though they were uneducated, quote unquote, and untrained, they had been with Jesus. So in the same vein, when I hung out with those surgeons for a year, my life changed even if I do not know it. In the same vein, if you are hanging out with Jesus, there is a transformation. People wonder what changed in this guy? What changed in this girl? What changed is that you have been hanging out with Jesus. The next thing that we can measure is our attitude. Our attitude determines our altitude. Apologies for the corny cliche. You see, our attitude occurs in spite of our circumstances. And we have an insight in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 as to why our circumstances as children of God are not always perfect. Because the idea we have is, you know, we want or what, what we want as individuals is that we want everything to be perfect, you know. Such that when people see us as Christians, all they see is, you know, perfection in terms of our circumstances. But what is more important as believers is our attitude to our circumstances whether they are perfect or not so second corinthians chapter 4 verse 1 and 7 to 10 tells us that since we have this ministry as we have received mercy we do not lose heart verse 7 to 10 tells us that but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. So, the truth about it is that sometimes the fact that we are earthen vessels, we are human beings carrying the power of God allows us to be able to depend on the Lord. 
to depend on the power of God to continuously transform us. And it gives us example. Or not only just transform you, but transform your attitude. Such that if your attitude used to be negative every time you face a difficult situation, the Holy Spirit will change that negative attitude to a positive attitude. The Bible says we are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. So, when you go through a difficulty, you don't get crushed down by that difficulty. The Bible says we are perplexed. You wonder, ah, God, why is this happening to me? Just like Jesus said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He asked the question. But the Bible says that we are not in despair. He says, persecuted, but not forsaken. So people may make your life difficult for whatever reason. But the fact is that the Lord is still with you. Because the Bible says, I am the Lord who holds you by your right hand, saying to you, do not fear. So once you know that God is holding your hand, it doesn't really matter. Reminds me of one time when we went to the camp. This was very, very early. I think it was the first or second year that the camp in Dallas we were having the meeting in the camp. And honestly, that year was very interesting because there was not enough parking by the camp. So if you are not one of those people who, some people know about know, um, camp metrics, you know, some people are 101, 201, people who, are, who live in the camp, they know that if you really want to go for um, the festival of light or the, 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 the Holy Ghost night, some people, they would have camped in camp from the morning and they're not going to leave the camp until morning, whenever the meeting is over. But for some of the people like us, we didn't do that. So we went back to the hotel and then we are coming back to the camp at night. It rained, number one. Number two, they blocked off all the entrances to the camp because there was no more parking and people were getting stuck in the mud. So they had a staging area and you had to walk probably three quarters of a mile to be able to get to the camp. And it was muddy that day. So, people were slipping and sliding and falling. You know, people with their camp clothes, you know. Um, and they, you see people, they will all of a sudden, the legs will come out from under them and they will face plant or back plant on the, in the mud. And the rest of us were like being very careful. So, I held my daughter with one hand. I think at that time we had maybe, we only had Ara at that time. Held my daughter with one hand, held my wife with the other hand, and we were gently, you know, navigating ourselves through the mud until we got to the camp. But you know the interesting thing, which is an aside, there was a lady who came with us to the camp who was believing God for the fruit of the womb. Let's just say that's the, that lady now has three children. But that's an aside. The fact that I was holding them by their hand and I was the most stable person among them meant that regardless of the circumstances, they knew that somebody was supporting them. In the same way, the Bible says struck down but not destroyed, persecuted and not forsaken, always carrying around in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus may also be manifest in our body. So we have insight that sometimes our circumstances will not always be perfect, but it's all right. They don't have to be perfect as you are being transformed. What is most important is the attitude by which you approach your circumstances because that attitude is going to determine how high you are going to go. 
the way we talk also is a measure or a way we can measure transformation the bible tells us in second corinthians 4 verse 13 to 15 it tells us that it is to show forth the power of god that we speak when we are transformed our way of talking changes it tells us that and since we have the same spirit of faith according to what is written i believed and therefore i spoke we also believe and therefore speak knowing that the god who raised jesus will also raise us up with jesus and will present us with you so the way you speak changes because the bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of god so it's something that i used to emphasize a lot in the early days of the church and i praise god that god is helping all of us some of us grew up in the you know in 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 our own culture where we're influenced where they will use all sorts of negativity to speak or we grew up with people speaking negativity in your life for example i loosely translated from the yoruba your head is not what correct you know your the cables in your brain are not really connected properly so it doesn't whatever computation you know is done in your brain it doesn't add up but you know people spoke that into our lives but you're not supposed to speak that into your children's life or into your husband's life or into your wife's life because if they the bible says our words carry power the bible tells us that by the words of your mouth will you be what justified and by your words, you will not be condemned. So if you speak into your li child's life, you that you are supposed to be able to speak the truth, you are supposed to speak to the mountain and tell the mountain to move and be cast into the sea. And you tell your, your child, your head is not correct. What do you think will happen to the head's child, child's head? And then you now come to night vigil in um, Dallas, night vigil in Houston, night vigil in Christ the Rock Chapel, and you start to say, ah, we need to pray, we need to speak life. Unto this, I speak life unto you. I speak life, but you have been speaking death to the child all along. My child is not passing, but you yourself, you use your own mouth to say that this child had the cables. You have this, even if God made the cables correct, you with your own mouth have disconnected the cables now. And now you are now looking for a deliverance minister to help you connect everything back again. The words of our mouth carry power. Thank God. The Bible says the times of ignorance God has overlooked and he calls all men to repentance. The words of your mouth are very powerful. So don't use the words of your mouth to speak negativity. One of the signs of transformation is that negativity ceases. And if you have the tendency or the urging to speak speak unto that negativity and say no i'm a child of god i speak positivity that's why the bible tells us second corinthians chapter 4 verse 2 for we have renounced the hidden things of shame not walking in craftiness nor handling the word of god deceitfully but by manifestation of the truth commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of god you should be the one speaking life unto people don't take anything else from this service. See my words. Carry power. I will speak life unto people. I will speak life unto those people around me. I will speak life unto myself. I will speak life unto my situation. In the name of Jesus. Finally, perspective. As children of God, one of the measures of transformation is an eternal perspective. The Bible tells us that 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17, it says, Therefore we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. 
for a light affliction which is but a moment is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory for we do not look at the things which are seen but we look at the things which are not seen for the things which are seen are temporary but the things which are not seen are eternal so as a child of god as you are being transformed you develop an eternal perspective you don't you you move yourself from a system of subsistence which is you know i survive on just what is in front of me you change your sight or your vision from one of myopia which only sees what is immediately in front of you and you get spiritual glasses so your eyes are opened because the bible talks about your eyes of understanding being opened so you start to perceive you are not concerned only about the immediate you know what you like it what you like where what you like put on that's what the bible says no the bible says the, the father has taken care of all those things already instead seek first the kingdom of god and his righteousness and all other things will be added unto you because it's all those things that the gentiles are hustling for but the bible says your father has already taken care of them so as a child of god a measure of transformation becomes us developing an eternal perspective we start to think of stuff from the point of view of what the redeemed church of god talks about our goal is to do what make heaven we are no longer thinking of our goals solely in terms of earthly perspective we're not just thinking of you know okay next this year i'm gonna buy a car when i buy a new car next year i'm buy a new house when i buy a new house i'm going to get my second house and when i do yeah it's good to do all those things nothing wrong with accumulation of all those things but the bible talks about the rich fool you know the parable of the rich fool and says that you know those happens to a man who is rich but is not rich towards god who has no eternal perspective of doing things you know he's saying i will be first i will build bands and then i'll build more bands and then i will store all my goods and after that one i'll say yeah eat drink and be merry for tomorrow i die you know that same approach I, i'm going to retire i'm i'm more i'm hustling now pastor i understand why why didn't we see you in in night vigil ah pastor i'm grinding now i've got to grind ah, pastor uh, uh, what, what about i didn't see you in sunday service ah, man, i'm grinding why because I want to retire when I'm 50. After that one, then I will serve God. But the issue about you grinding is that you grind until you are 50. And then, what next? You don't want to be like that rich fool. You say, okay, tonight, your soul is required of you. So you have accumulated all the retirement. And then, who's going to get that retirement? That's why the Bible talks about it in the book of Ecclesiastes. I've seen a man. You know, he, 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 he hustled. He was grinding all of a sudden. He has no son. He has no, nobody to give the thing to. Then Solomon was looking at Why was he disturbing himself? Grinding. And then, it is somebody else who comes to inherit all those things. So the Bible says, build you up for yourself treasures where no moth can decay. Build yourself treasures in heaven. There's nothing wrong with planning for your retirement because it's not, it's not pastor that will be the one to pay for your retirement. Get your retirement fund. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm trying to tell you is that if all you are hustling for, the only thing you are looking for, looking forward to, is your retirement because they tell you that everybody has a number isn't it so you are carrying your number around and that number must continuously be increasing like a ticker tape they tell you if you marry if you retire in america without one million dollars you, you are in trouble so pastor you grind until i make sure my money my money is more than a million 
you have to make sure that at the process of whatever you are doing, make sure you are rich towards God. Make sure you are being transformed so that you can make an impact for God. You can bear fruit for him. And we're going to look at some more things subsequently. But today, let's pray because we have heard enough. You know, it's important for us now to make sure that what we have heard, we mix it with faith. So it will be of benefit to us. Just bow your head, you know. First things first, you know, you are somebody who you need to give your life over to Jesus. The Bible says, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? So, you need to give your life over to Jesus. It's very simple. You want to make, you want to start the process of transformation. You want to jumpstart the initial transformation. And the Bible says in Romans 10 verse 9 that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus died for you, you will be saved. So I want you to say this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I invite you into my heart. I know your son Jesus died for me on the cross of Calvary. I want you to be my Lord and Savior. I confess my sins and I ask you to forgive me. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you made this call, you're online, send a message to info at rcccchristtherock.org so we can encourage you in your faith. If you made that promise today, I want you to walk up to the usher and give him your name so we can encourage you. For the rest of those who desire transformation, who want to move to maturity, We are going to pray and join together because the Bible says, with God, all things are possible. You may tell yourself that you don't, I don't see myself changing. I don't see myself stopping. Whatever it is that you are dealing with, I don't see myself being able to look at myself in the mirror and make a change. I want you to know that with God, all things are possible. And you can do all things through Jesus Christ who strengthens you. So we're going to join together in prayer and pray the prayer of faith today. Lord Jesus, I join together with your people here for every soul that's believing you for a transformation. That's believing you to jumpstart the process of transformation in their life such that as they behold the mirror, they will be transformed from glory to glory. Lord, I join together with them because your word says whenever two or three agree on something on earth, it is agreed in heaven. So right now, we know that every single soul that desires in their heart to move forward, to show the measure of transformation, to be able to shine as lights in this corrupt generation, to be transformed in the way they act, in the way they think, in the way they show themselves to the world, which is every single one of us, Lord. My prayer is that by your power, you will do it today in the name of Jesus. Father, each and every one of us is being transformed to be more like you just as by the Spirit of God today in the name of Jesus. We identify, Lord, those things that need to change in our life and our situation. And Lord, 
in the name of Jesus because we are crucified with Christ and it's not any of us that are living anymore but it is Christ that is living in us so Lord transform us today in the name of Jesus thank you Lord Thank you for your visitation. Thank you for your divine presence in our midst today. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Praise God.